Hello, this lecture is on World War I. However, it's not a military history. Rather, I'm taking a look at how big business and government join forces for war mobilization. One contrib contributing factor to the outbreak of World War I was imperialism. Imperialism, imperialism is the extension by one country of its authority over other lands by political, military, or economic means. Leading up to World War I, the United States had a different approach than most other powerful nations. Leading European nations carved up global regions and created many colonies. The European division of the African continent is a clear example. The scramble for Africa in the last quarter of the 19th century saw the slicing up of almost all the continent. In 1900, only Ethiopia and Liberia remained independent. The United States differentiated, differentiated its empire from that of the Europeans. It did not set out to claim territory to colonize and populate. Americans preferred that native inhabitants ruled themselves under informal American protection. Trade rather than territory was preferred. American isolationism meant that America was slow to enter World War I. America declared war against Germany in April 1917, and it was only a matter of time when American troops and supplies would make a major difference. An equally important American story is the emergence of a business and government partnership for war mobilization that was, that was different from the limited government of the past. After the Civil War, the United States gained Alaska by purchase from Russia. Russia regarded Alaska as potentially valuable, but in the short term, an unprofitable asset. The Russians began talks on selling Alaska to the Americans for $7.2 million. The purchase of Alaska at approximately two cents an acre was a major triumph. In addition to the natural resources of gold and oil, Alaska provided Americans during the 20th century Cold War with stations for their bombers. American leaders generally open European uh, generally oppose European style imperialism, but there were exceptions. Americans cast their eyes on Samoa and Hawaii in the Pacific. In 1878, America received rights to a coaling station at Pago Pago, and in exchange, Samoa received U.S. support against foreign powers. A three-power protectorate, the United States, Germany, and Great Britain, over Samoa in 1889 proved inherently unworkable. Ten years later, the Samoan archipelago was divided between Germany and the US. In the early 1890s, tensions rose between the United States and Hawaii's Queen Liliuokalani. In 1893, the Queen yields her authority when 150 American troops landed, led by John L. Stevens, an annexationist U.S. minister. <clears throat> With only lukewarm support of President Benjamin Harrison, Stevens proclaimed Hawaii a protectorate. In 1898, America annexed Hawaii 
and the islands became a first line of defense to ward off any attacks on the mainland. Some desired that America annex Cuba, but it did not happen. Annexation was problematic because of the racial, constitutional, and political problems that would inevitably rise. But there was war. In 1898, a powerful explosion sank the American battleship Maine anchored in Havana Harbor. The explosion killed more than 250 Americans. William Randolph Hearst and the Yellow Press, and the Yellow Press would be screaming headlines and journalistic demagoguery, stepped up their production of, quote, war extras. Congress responded by voting 50 million for war. With reluctance, President William McKinley sent a war message to Congress. The Spanish-American War was short. George Dewey, the American commander in the Pacific, destroyed Spanish ships in Manila and later captured the city. American success in Cuba began with an invasion in June 1898. After American victory over the Spanish, Cuba became independent and the United States took control of Puerto Rico, Guam, and the Philippines. The Cubans, however, had to accept the Platt Amendment to their constitution that gave the United States the right to land troops in Cuba to maintain law and order, limited the amount of debt the island could accumulate, and later made Guantanamo a US naval base. The American victory over Spain in the Philippines emboldened the United States to maintain an open door policy in China, experiencing both internal and external pressures. China was on the verge of being carved up by Europeans. The United States insisted that China remain open on an equal basis to all outsiders and that Chinese sovereignty be recognized in all parts of the empire. Even though it, its land acquisitions were modest compared to European imperialist powers, the United States stood on the world stage as a major power. In August 1914, European leaders sent a generation to war. Young men marched off to the cheers of parents, teachers, political leaders, kings, and the public. They were seeking, they were seeking honor and glory. What they found instead was slaughter, filth, vermin, starvation and disease. When the United States entered the war three years later, there was a better understanding of the despair, ugliness and horror of modern warfare. In a last desperate offensive in March 1918, the Germans advanced westward with more than 1 million men intending to finish what they had started in the fall of 1914. They were unsuccessful. The Germans were eventually forced back to Belgium, the Rhine and beyond. On November 11, 1918, the war was over. Two million American soldiers had gone to France and 50,000 died in battle. In 1914, most Americans favored neutrality. 
believing that the war did not concern them, but there were forces at work to see American participation. Some scholars maintain that progressives were among the most vocal supporters of America entering the war. Moreover, progressive ideas played out during the very short period of Americans' involvement in the war had a long lasting impact. Economist Murray Rothbard argues that war collectivism dominated a totally planned economy run largely by big business interests through the instrumentality of the central government served as the model, the president, and the inspiration for state corporate capitalism for the remainder of the 20th century. This is what Rothbard argues. America's big business had extensive ties with England and France. Big business leaders were confident of the extensive planning and economic mobilization that the war could clearly entail. The United States Chamber of Commerce was an early enthusiast for war mobilization. The Chamber of Commerce desired a sharing of power between business and government. In 1916, the chairman of the Chamber of Commerce wrote that, quote, this munitions question would seem to be the greatest opportunity to foster the new spirit of cooperation between government and industry. In the same year, the Committee of Industrial Preparedness was an official arm of the federal government with pri private financial support. The chairman was Howard E. Coffin, who was vice president of Hudson Motor Company. So Coffin and other industrialist members of the committee champion a blended public private approach to economic mobilization for war. Supportive was much of the press, including the New York Times and the great bulk of American industry. The fully governmental Council of National Defense succeeded the Committee of Preparedness Committee in late 1916. Its advisory commission was mostly private industrialists. The public-private arrangement was a new order that represented a major shift from the largely free market capitalism and limited government of the past. Key industrialists favored the pervasive government planning because it offered subsidies and monopolistic privileges to big business. The economy was to be car cartelized under the guidance of government with prices raised and production fixed and restricted in the classic pattern of monopoly. The collusion on prices that a cartel arrangement offered was popular with business leaders. Their compliance with the government paid handsomely. Government contracts were channeled into the hands of favorite, favored corporate producers. The industrialists were confident that this new order could control labor by making union leaders junior partners in the planning. As the thinking went, the older laissez-faire capitalist arrangement was outdated. There was ample propaganda reassuring Americans that the new order was for the common good of all citizens. 
liberal intellectuals welcomed the prestige they received for promoting the new order that they believed was superior to both capitalism and socialism. In essence, they are seeing this as sort of a third way. For them, the new order brought harmony and cooperation to all classes on behalf of the general welfare under the direction of big government. President Woodwell Wilson applauded how the Council of National Defense opened up communication and cooperation between business and government. Howard Coffin wrote, it is our hope that we may lay the foundation for that closely knit structure, industrial, civil, and military, which every thinking American has come to realize is vital to the future life of this country in peace and in commerce, no less than in possible war." End of quote. Before the United States entered the war, the Council of National Defense made extensive plans on the purchase of war supplies, the system of good control and censorship of the press. Business leaders were put into separate committees where they co co cooperated with government in fixing prices of their products. In April 1917, Wilson asked Congress to declare war. His war message included the following. It is a fearful thing to lead this great peaceful people into war, but the right is more precious than peace, and we shall fight for the things which we always carry nearest our hearts, for democracy, dominion of right, by such a concert of free peoples as shall bring peace and safety to all nations and make the world itself at last free." End of quote. The federal government brought in unprecedented measures, brought in unprecedented measures, a sharply graduated income tax, conscription of troops for a foreign war, increasing management of the economy, and a massive propaganda campaign. In July, there was the creation of the War Industry Board that became the central age agency for collectivism. In March 1918, Bernard Barak took control of the agency. Big business leaders were highly visible from the board level to the multiple divisions. The agency demanded compliance, but there was some resistance from mavericks who opposed the way industry was drafted into the war effort. Grossvenir Clarkson, the director of the Council of National Defense wrote, there were bitter and stormy protests here and there, especially from those industries that were curtailed or suspended, but the rents in the garment of authority were amply filled by the docile and cooperative spirit of industry. The occasional obstructor fled from the mandates of the board only to find himself ostracized by his fellows in industry. Harry A. Wheeler, vice president of the Union Trust Company declared, quote, war is the stern teacher that is driving home the lessons of cooperative effort. Wheeler and others believe that co cooperative planning alone could make the United States economically efficient. The price fiction fixing was problematic for free marketers who understood that tampering with prices was counterproductive and far from efficient. They argued it would not protect the public against wartime inflation, as proponents claimed. 
business, many business leaders, ironically, did not appear to understand basic economics. Their focus and reason for supporting a system of war collectivism was the promise of stabilizing prices and ironing out market fluctuations. The leaders of large in industries, such as the steel industry, saw price fixing as a way to control worker wages. They had faith in central planning. The Food Administration, led by Herbert Hoover, was another agency enthusiastic with price controls. The Food Administration used licensing to keep the food industry in line. To stay in business, food dealers, producers, distributors, and warehouse operators required a license. There was a major information drive by the government. In his 1920 book, Government Control Over Prices, Paul Willard, Paul Willard Garrett wrote, quote, the country was literally strewn with millions of pamphlets and leaflets designed to educate the people of the food situation. There were food administration insignia for the coat lapel, store window, the restaurant, the train, and the home. A real stigma was placed upon the person who was not loyal to food administration ethics through pressure by the schools, churches, women's clubs, public libraries, merchants associations, fraternal organization, and other social groups, end of quote. Food producers who cut prices to make more sales were dealt with severely by the food administration. One goal of the government and supportive industries was to have stable prices rather than lower prices for consumers. The Grain Corporation established by Herbert Hoover had the task of enforcing the artificially high prices of wheat to assist bakers who paid high prices for wheat and flour, the government allowed bakers to mix inferior products with wheat flour at a fixed ratio. Railroad leaders joined with government to coordinate railroad operations. The Railroads War Board was another example of a government promoted monopoly. In the name of efficiency and standardization, railroad executives demanded compliance from all railroad operations. With the government taking over the railroads, the, rail, the railroad administration had the power to set freight rate prices. Freight rate increases of 25% by the Railroad Administration in early 1918 were without any public hearings or consultations with other interests. Never had America seen a powerful government planning and organizing the economy. Big business was able to use the government to cartelize, cartelize the economy, restrict competition, and regulate production and prices. The economic control by the alliance of government and big business dependent on media assistance. The, the restructuring of, economy, of economics that pushed aside free market principles received the support of the leading intellectual organ of progressivism. Founded in 1914, 
the New Republic magazine was a living embodiment of the burgeoning alliance between big business interests and collectivist intellectuals. With writers such as John Dewey, Herbert David Crawley, and Walter Lippmann, the New Republic applauded the new society molded by the war. Dewey was a champion of progressive secular statism. On government's go greater control, he declared that this way may easily be the beginning of the end of business. There's no reason to believe that the old principle will ever be resumed. Private property had already lost its sanctity. Industrial democracy is on the way. The New Republic argued the need for America to expand its government. The journalists desired a more democratic version of European socialism. A big government, big, big business alliance would usher in immense gains in national efficiency and happiness. Walter Lippmann stated, we who have gone to war to ensure democracy in the world will have raised an inspiration here that will not end with the overthrow of the Prussian autocracy. We shall turn with fresh interest to our own tyrannies, to our Colorado mines, our autocratic steel industry, sweatshops, and our slums. A force is loose in America. Our own reactionaries will not assuage it. We shall know how to deal with them. Interestingly, interestingly the 27-year Littman, who was supportive of conscription of men, but not for him. He got the progressive law professor, Felix Frankfurter, to get him an exemption from fighting. As for the New Republic, it continued to write against the evils of individual competition. According to econ economist Murray Rothbard, the nationalization of railroads and shipping, the priorities and allocation system, the total domination of all parts of the food industry achieved by Herbert Hoover and the Food Administration, the pro-union policy, the high taxes, and the draft were all hailed by the New Republic as an expansion of democracy's power to plan for the general good. So it was a powerful combination of big business and government. The New Republic, the New Republic did much to promote the war with progressive intellectuals, but the formation of the Committee on Public Information in April of 1917 guaranteed that the greater American public media would understand the importance of the government's approach to defeating the Germans. Under the leadership of George Creel, a progressive journalist, the Committee on Public Information released 75 million pieces of printed material. So the, this big business, this big business government combination, the blending of the two, they were especially powerful given that they had the overwhelming support of the media. At the end of World War I, 
No country in the world was stronger economically and militarily as the United States. And this appeared to be proof that war collectivism was a success. So despite the restrictions on freedom, the price fixing and the control with production, all of this for the progressives was, was proof that this was the, the proper approach. Others, others, however, disagreed that the big business, big government was the reason for America's rise on the world scene. The, the United States was in the war less than 19 months. The European industrial powers paid a much higher price militarily and economically. Even with economic policies that were restrictive and short on economic freedom, America uh, came out far ahead of Germany, Russia, France, and Britain. Thank you.